When the Buddha set out the precepts for the monks, he would often give a long talk about his reason for the precepts. And the reasons came into three sorts. One is that they were inspiring to others. Two is they're good for peace within the community. And three is they're good for battling your own defilements. The same principles apply to the precepts as well. You stick with the five precepts, the eight precepts. It's inspiring to other people. I often tell Thais, whose English isn't very good, this is how you teach Buddhism to people in America, by holding to your precepts. Secondly, it's good for the peace within the community. And then three, it's good for training your defilements, taming your defilements. So when you hold to the precepts, it's good all around. When you break the precepts, for whatever reason, it can damage any of those three things. Sometimes you hear the belief that well, nowadays certain things that were popular in the Buddhist time or admired in the Buddhist time are not admired now, so we should change some of the precepts or come up with ex exceptions. But it wasn't always the case that the Buddha would just go along with about everybody liked. There was the story of the community where the monks were extremely friendly, as the lay people said. You know, the monks are the first to say, you are welcome. Come, you are welcome. They were the first to smile, the first to go out of their way, to be friendly and ingratiating, and doing all kinds of things to please the lay people. <coughs> please the lay people. There was a monk who was very well behaved, very restrained, came to that city one time, and the lay people made fun of him. Who is this weakest of weaklings? This most snobbish of snobs. He's not like our friendly monks. So the monk reported this to the Buddha, and the Buddha called in the monks from that city and gave them a good lecture. In other words, you don't bend the precepts just to please people. If you're going to be inspiring to people, you want to be people who have good eyes and appreciate what really is honorable, what really is good. As for people who don't appreciate that, you just have to let them go. Then if you break the precepts to please people, it's bad for the community and it's bad for your own training. Because once they say you break the precept, then they're going to expect the other people to break the precept as well. That's one thing. And secondly, there's the question of trust. I know with my time with the John Fu, and one of the things that gave me the greatest sense of security was that he always stuck by the precepts. And there was pressure, even in Thailand, where people know the precepts and have an Asian culture, but they didn't like certain things, certain rules that the monks held by. And I know I had to fight off certain things that lay people wanted to do in the monastery that were not right. And I always knew I'd have a John Fu's backing. So this is one of the ways in which a teacher becomes trustworthy, is by holding the precepts. And the same holds for a student. If a student breaks the precepts easily just because a lay person makes a funny face or complains, the teacher doesn't have a sense of trust for the student. That's bad for the community. And then finally, for your own training. How seriously do you take the precepts? The Buddha said that one of the marks of the Sangha that inspired the Asuras was that just as the sea wouldn't overcome its boundaries, the monks wouldn't overcome the boundaries set by the precepts, even if their life was at stake. So the precepts are a serious part of the practice. They're part of your meditation. I told you before that time when, at the end of a retreat, some people asked to John Sawat, you know, going, the retreatants going back into lay life, how should they meditate? How should they carry their meditation into daily life? And he started with the five precepts. And some of the people got upset, thinking that he was looking down at lay people, that they weren't capable of meditating in daily life, and all they could manage was the lowly precepts. But that wasn't the point he was making. 
The point was that if you hold by the precepts, you're learning mindfulness, you're learning discernment. Mindfulness and keeping the precepts in mind, discernment and learning how to apply them wisely. For instance, how do you hold the precept against lying without divulging damaging truths? Well, there's a skill. You can develop that skill. How do you live in a world where there are pests without killing them? There's a skill. And by developing that skill, you're developing your, your discernment. The monks among the protocols. And John Munn made heavy use of the protocols in his training of the monks, the, the duties you have in cleaning your hut, the duties you have in looking after your teacher, the duties you have in looking after the place where the monks all eat their meals, the duties ha you have when you go to a place, the duties you have when you're leaving a place. All these things require that you're very scrupulous. And being scrupulous is a really good aid in developing mindfulness. And many times the way he would teach these things was not through telling you what to do, but forcing you to be observant. There's that story about a John Lee staying with a John Mun. One of his duties was to clean up a John Mun's room every day. And the John Mun was always complaining. Things weren't in their right places. But he'd never tell John Lee where the right places were. So one day, John Lee got an idea. He, John Mun was living in a hut that had banana leaf walls, and so he poked a hole in one of the walls with his finger. Then after he'd cleaned up the room and John Mun went into the room, then John Lee went to peek in. Pretty sure John Munn knew what was happening. He looked around, he changed this, changed that. Put this here, put that there. And John Lee took note of everything. And then the next day when he cleaned the room, he put things in the places where John Munn had put them. And then went out and peeked through the hole again. And John Munn went into the room, looked left, looked right, didn't see anything that had to move, so he sat down and said his chance. And John Lee felt very, very gratified. And John Fuang was the same way with me, although his hut didn't have banana leaf walls, so there's no way he could poke holes in them. So I had to be observant when, when he opened the door to his room and I looked in to see where things were. So that when the time came for me to arrange the room, I had an idea of where he wanted these things. Again, it was all training in being scrupulous, being observant, i.e. developing your powers of mindfulness and discernment. And of course, when you've been holding by the precepts and you can look back on your behavior for the day and there are no lapses, and it's a lot easier for the mind to settle down and to get into concentration. So even when it's unpopular, hold by the precepts. They're your training. We live here in a monastery that's way away from the rest of Thailand. In a sense, we're kind of like a moon colony. And one way we may maintain a sense of connection with the tradition that we're training in is by holding to the precepts wherever we go. That connection is like being rooted. If you cut your root, you know what happens to a, a tree when its root is cut. So protect your precepts with your life, as the Buddha would say. They're basic to the practice.